Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ. We're meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we're returning to our study of the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We have titled this In the Wilderness. And tonight we're coming to the very end of our study of the book of Numbers. So we're wrapping up the study of Numbers tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers 34. As always, if you have any questions at all, any concerns or any comments about tonight's class, feedback, good or bad, if you have something we need to be praying about as a church, if there's some way that we can encourage you, we want to invite you to reach out. You can get in touch by sending me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274, and that'd be a great way of getting in touch with us. But as I said, tonight we come to the end of our study of the book of Numbers, so we're going to be looking at Numbers chapters 34, 35, and 36. If you've been with us for this study for any length of time, you know we've been moving rather quickly. But by way of very brief review, though, in case you're just joining us here at the end, the book of Numbers is a book of numbers. So we have two census. Censuses? Census? I don't know. So we've got uh, uh, Moses counts the people two times. I think that would maybe be an easier way for me to word that. But once at the beginning, again, at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. And now we're at the very end. So they've already had that second census. They're camped out practically right across the river from the city of Jericho. And they're preparing to make that leadership transition from Moses over to Joshua. So let's start in tonight with some instructions concerning the boundaries of the promised land. This comes in Numbers 34, verses 1 through 15. I know there's a lot here, but a lot of names that may not mean much to us. So we're just going to plow through it rather quickly. Numbers 34, 1 through 15. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, even the land of Canaan according to its borders. Your southern sector shall extend from the wilderness of Zin along the side of Edom, and your southern border shall extend from the end of the Salt Sea eastward. Then your border shall turn direction from the south to the ascent of the Akrabim and continue to Zin. And its termination shall be to the south of Kadesh Barnea, and it shall reach Hazarader and continue to Asmon. The border shall turn direction from Asmon to the brook of Egypt, and its termination shall be at the sea. As for the western border, you shall have the great sea, that is, its coastline. This shall be your west border. And this shall be your north border. You shall draw your border line from the great sea to Mount Hor. You shall draw a line from Mount Hor to the Libo Hamath, and the termination of the border shall be at Zedad. And the border shall proceed to Ziphron, and its termination shall be at Hazar Enon. This shall be your north border. For your eastern border, you shall also draw a line from Hazar Enon to Shepham, and the border shall go down from Shepham to Riblah on the east side of Ain. And the border shall go down and reach to the slope on the east side of the Sea of Chinnereth, and the border shall go down to the Jordan, and its termination shall be at the Salt Sea. This shall be your land according to its borders all around. So Moses commanded the sons of Israel, saying, This is the land that you are to apportion by lot among you as a possession, which the Lord has commanded to give to the nine and a half tribes. For the tribe of the sons of Reuben have received theirs, according to their father's households, and the tribe of the sons of Gad, according to their father's households, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their possession. The two and a half tribes have received their possession across the Jordan opposite Jericho, eastward toward the sun rising. Well, in a time before maps were too common, I'm not saying they didn't have maps back then, but I'm saying it would have been kind of rare for anybody to have one. And since this is a written document with actual words, not diagrams, the Lord explains to Moses where the promised land actually is in terms of its boundaries. And we have landmarks here. Uh, today, especially in a city like the city of Madison, we have survey markers. We've got pins and we've got concrete markers and we've got all kinds of uh, different markers here. Um, it was a challenge a few years ago to find the boundaries around our church property there on the corner of Jade and Acewood Boulevard. But we had a, I had a metal detector that I'd used to do the same thing at our house and my parents' house. So we used that and found the markers, uh, did some marking, found out that actually part of the neighbor's fence is on our property. That was kind of a surprise to us. 
and you find out all kinds of things when you start doing surveys. And there's a survey marker manufacturing company right here in Madison, which is um, interesting. I, I, Bernson, I can't remember the name of it. It's over near the airport, I believe, but a foundry. And uh, they make all kinds of markers. The uh, yeah. president of the Neighborhood Association over by church actually works for them, or at least has in the past. But anyway, they didn't have a lot of the equipment or maps that we may have, so they couldn't just pull up Access Dane or the Madison City Assessor site to find their property lines. And so we've got references here to rivers and seas and mountains and little cities and villages and even other nations. And then in the rest of this chapter, uh, we basically have the names of the men who would be responsible for actually dividing up the land. So I think we're going to skip over... Um, this last paragraph, feel free to read these names, of course. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Feel free to do it. Uh, they would have been important to the people who were reading this for the first time. Uh, but I would say tentatively kind of less so for us. So not really some practical application that I'm gaining out of all the rest of the names in this chapter. So let's skip ahead then to Numbers 35. And we're going to pick up with the first paragraph, Numbers 35, 1 through 5. Numbers 35, 1 through 5. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they give to the Levites from the inheritance of their possessions cities to live in. And you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities. The cities shall be theirs to live in, and their pasture lands shall be for their cattle and for their herds and for all their beasts. The pasture lands of the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall extend from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits around. You shall also measure outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, and on the south side 2,000 cubits, and on the west side 2,000 cubits, and on the north side 2,000 cubits, with the city in the center. This shall become theirs as pasture lands for the cities. So here at the end of the book, we've got some instruction concerning the land for the Levites. We've already looked at the tribes themselves, the rest of them. Uh, but since the Levites were to serve in the temple, that was their job. Uh, they were not given large areas of land like the other tribes. However, God did allow them to have some cities. And they were given some pasture land around those cities, 2,000 cubits in all directions. So this is part of how they'll be cared for. So now we're going to continue with some more information about these cities that were given to the Levites. This is Numbers 35. Let's look at verses 6 through 15. Numbers 35, verses 6 through 15. The cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, which you shall give for the manslayer to flee to. And in addition to them, you shall give 42 cities. All the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be 48 cities together with their pasture lands. As for the cities which you shall give from the possession of the sons of Israel, you shall take more from the larger and you shall take less from the smaller. Each shall give some of his cities to the Levites in proportion to his possession, which he inherits which he inherits. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select for yourselves cities to be your cities of refuge, that the manslayer who has killed any person unintentionally may flee there. The city shall be to you as a refuge from the avenger, so that the manslayer will not die until he stands before the congregation for trial." The cities which you are to give shall be your six cities of refuge. You shall give three cities across the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan. They are to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the sons of Israel and for the alien and for the sojourner among them that anyone who kills a person unintentionally may flee there. The Levites then were given 48 cities and six of these were to be designated as cities of refuge. In other words, these were places you could flee if you accidentally killed somebody, all right? So if a dead man's relatives were out to get you, uh, you could flee to one of these cities for safety until the locals could hold a trial. And I personally think about these cities almost like they were home base in a game of tag. I think that's what we called it, or like a hide and seek when you ran around. And as long as you made it back and, and touched the base, you were safe. That's the that's the impression I get here. So if you are out chopping wood and the head flies off your axe and uh, cuts your neighbor's head off, you know, his family is going to be kind of mad at you. And they've got kind of a right to be upset. They've just lost a loved one in this gruesome slaying. And so it was a homicide. One man led to the death of another man. But it was an accident. And so if, if they were out to get you, you could run and make it to one of these cities until the authorities could sort it out. 
That was the rule. Kind of an interesting thing going on. And they were to designate three cities on the east side of the Jordan as well as three cities to the west. So these were to be pretty fairly evenly spread out. Um, so it would kind of make it easier to get to these places. So let's continue with the guidance for those who kill another person intentionally. So this is Numbers 35, 16 through 21. Numbers 35, 16 through 21. But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. If he struck him down with a stone in the hand by which he will die, and as a result he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he struck him with a wooden object in the hand by which he might die, and as a result he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The blood avenger himself shall put the murderer to death. He shall put him to death when he meets him. If he pushed him of hatred or threw something at him lying in wait and as a result he died, or if he struck him down with his hand in enmity or anger and as a result he died, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The blood avenger shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. So basically, if someone picks up something and strikes another person on purpose and they die, that person is a murderer. And he's not deserving of fleeing to a city of refuge. He is to be put to death himself. Uh, putting to death a murderer, by the way, is not murder. It is justice. Uh, the same goes for if a person pushes another person in a fit of rage. If someone throws something at somebody while lying in wait for the other person, the murderer is to be put to death by the avenger. And this is personal, isn't it? And so the avenger is, I would think, a relative or a loved one of the one who was murdered. They had a right to go after those who had killed their loved ones intentionally. All right, let's continue with some guidance for those who kill another person accidentally. Maybe some clarification here. Numbers 35, 22 through 29. Numbers 35, 22 through 29. But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity or threw something out him without lying in wait or with any dis uh, deadly object of stone and without seeing it, dropped it on him so that he died while he was not his enemy nor seeking his injury, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger according to these ordinances. The congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the blood avenger, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he fled, and he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer at any time goes beyond the border of his city of refuge to which he may flee, and the blood avenger finds him outside the border of his city of refuge, and the blood avenger kills the manslayer, he will not be guilty of blood." because he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer shall return to the land of his possession. These things shall be for a statutory ordinance to you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So as opposed to striking somebody on purpose, as opposed to hiding and jumping out and attacking somebody you're mad at, uh, this passage deals with unintentional killings. And I know, of course, it's possible to kill somebody without intending to do so. Maybe you just throw something at somebody, not intending on hurting them. You know, you're, you're working together, you toss them a shovel and, you know, something happens. Or maybe there's a, like a construction accident and a, a huge block of stone falls off, you touch it, you lean against it, it falls off, it kills the guy. I mean, in that case, uh, there is to be a trial of some kind. The congregation is to decide the matter, so they need to look at the evidence, maybe interview witnesses and ask, you know, what were you thinking at the time, and so on. Uh, if he's innocent, the people are to return the guy who's done the killing to the city of refuge, so the family cannot take revenge. If the killer leaves the city of refuge, though, he's fair game. And that's an interesting twist here. But there are some rules to this, and so this is to be a, a civil society compared to maybe what was going on there at the time. And we also find here there is to be a continual reset every so many years tied to the death of the current high priest. So there was kind of a, a reset of the timeline. Well, let's continue with some guidance for the trial itself. This is Numbers 35, 30 through 34. Numbers 35, 30 through 34. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death in the testimony of one witness. 
Moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. You shall not take ransom for him who has fled to a city of refuge, that he may return to live in the land before the death of the priest. So you shall not pollute the land in which you are, for blood pollutes the land. And no expiation can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, am dwelling in the midst of the sons of Israel. Well, in a trial, we find here they must have a plurality of witnesses. One witness is not enough to establish the death penalty. Also, if a man found guilty of murder, um, he shouldn't be able to buy his way out of the death penalty. That's the way I would take verse 31. There can be no ransom in the case of a murder. In other words, if I murder somebody and I'm held, there's a trial held and I'm found guilty of death, I can't say, wait. You know, here's a thousand dollars. Now, how about that? Am I still guilty? That doesn't work. That's not going to fly in God's opinion. So there can be no ransom. There can be no swapping of gold for a person's life in this case. If you murder somebody, you are guilty of it and you are to pay with the shedding of your own blood. The only way to deal with murder is to take the life of the one who committed the murder. Blood for blood. Otherwise, the land itself is defiled. Okay, let's continue by uh, taking a look at the last chapter in Numbers. So we're going to start with the first four verses, Numbers 36, 1 through 4. We've got another special circumstance under the law that needs a little bit of clarification. We've had something similar a few chapters ago. But Numbers 36, 1 through 4. And the heads of the father's households of the family of the sons of Gilead, the son of Macher, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near. And spoke before Moses and before the leaders, the heads of the father's households of the sons of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land by lot to the sons of Israel as an inheritance. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, to his daughters. But if they marry one of the sons of the other tribes of the sons of Israel, their inheritance will be withdrawn from the inheritance of our fathers and will be added to the inheritance of the tribe to which they belong Thus it will be withdrawn from our allotted inheritance. When the jubilee of the sons of Israel comes, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe to which they belong, so their inheritance will be withdrawn from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Well, I've read that a few times. If I understood this correctly, this is a clarification of another ruling that we studied a few weeks ago. Uh, you may remember how the daughters with no brothers were worried about keeping their family inheritance and the name alive. And so they, since the inheritance was to go through the sons, there were no sons, they were just these women. And so they approached Moses with this concern, and God um, ruled on behalf of the women. So God took the ladies' side here, and uh, he said the women can, in fact, receive the inheritance. So you are not cut off. The father's house will continue. But now we've got another somewhat related issue. The question is, if these women marry outside the tribe, what then happens to the land itself. So now we're talking land. We're not just talking money inheritance. We're talking a piece of property. So since the land is tied to a tribe, not just the individual family. So it's like, okay, you said this, Lord, and then you said this, but now what? So now that land is getting assigned, they, they start seeing a problem here, or at least a potential problem. And I know it's not a perfect parallel, um, but imagine... Uh, my wife being the only descendant on her side, and she's from Alaska. And if she marries me here in Wisconsin, do we now have a few acres of Alaska that's now located in Wisconsin? You know, and I know it's not a perfect parallel, but I, I think it illustrates the problem. If someone in that situation were to marry outside the tribe, we would end up with bits and pieces of the 12 tribes spread out all over the promised land. Can we picture that? And that's not a good situation, is it? I mean, imagine that map. You know, if every individual has their own little tribe. So you got like somebody from Manasseh who's married over here to uh, the, somebody from the tribe of Simeon. So you get a little piece of Manasseh's land over here. And that, you know, that's not going to work. And it, it gets complicated in a hurry. So this is the question that they pose to uh, Moses. 
So let's continue with the answer. This is found in Numbers 36, verses 5 through 12. Numbers 36, 5 through 12. Then Moses commanded the sons of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph are right in their statements. This is what the Lord has commanded concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry whom they wish, only they must marry within the family of the tribe of their father. Thus no inheritance of the sons of Israel shall be transferred from tribe to tribe, for the sons of Israel shall each hold to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. Every daughter who comes into possession of an inheritance of any tribe of the sons of Israel shall be wife to one of the family of the tribe of her father, so that the sons of Israel each may possess the inheritance of his fathers. Thus no inheritance shall be transferred from one tribe to another tribe, for the tribes of the sons of Israel shall each hold to his own inheritance. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the daughters of Zelophehad did. Mala, Tizra, Hagla, Milcah, and Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, married their uncle's sons. They married those from the families of the sons of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained with the tribe of the family of their father. Well, in response to the concern, God's reply through Moses is that the sons of Joseph, they've got a legitimate question. And the ruling is those women, and really anyone else in that situation, they are allowed to marry whoever they want to marry, as long as they marry within their father's tribe. And it's not a perfect solution, but it does deal with that problem. And, you know, that way the land stays within the tribe and it is not split up into tinier and tinier chunks spread all through the land through the year. So the land stays with the tribe. And the solution is acceptable to the women. They marry their uncle's sons and the inheritance stays within the tribe of their father. Well, we've got one verse left in the whole book. So let's wrap it up tonight with Numbers 36, verse 13. Numbers 36, 13. These are the commandments and the ordinances which the Lord commanded to the sons of Israel through Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho. And that's it. We've made our way through the book of Numbers. And we end here with the people camped out in the plains of Moab right beside the Jordan River across the river from the city of Jericho. So next week, if the Lord wills, we are heading for the book of Deuteronomy. And this is where Moses basically repeats the law before they cross over. So it's going to be some more review. We'll have some new information here, but I'm looking forward to it. And I plan on moving through Deuteronomy rather quickly as well. As always, thank you again for being with us tonight. If there's anything that we need to be praying about or some way that we can encourage or help you, uh, we invite you to reach out by sending an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we know that you are a God who sees what is done to your people. And we know that you are a God who loves us. You are a God who is jealous for us. You want what is absolutely best for us. You want our obedience. And so we come to you tonight asking for your help that we would not sin, that we would always find the way of escape that you've promised. As you've instructed, we pray tonight for governing authorities. We pray for wisdom on their behalf. And we pray that whatever comes next, uh, that we as your people would be able to lead quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. Thank you for making us a part of your eternal kingdom, the church. We come to you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.